All right, let's talk about um, routes of administration. So um, when we start to think about administering drugs, when we discuss the routes of administration, what we're really trying to figure out is where do, are we putting these medications and how do they work? So the first thing to make sure we understand is the difference between a local action and a systemic action. So essentially local action means that the drug acts right where you put it. So the drug acts where it's placed. Most of the time drugs that are producing a local effect are drugs that are administered directly to the skin or to a mucous membrane. There are some there, there are some kind of gray areas, like for example, uh, if someone's having an asthma attack and they use a meter dose inhaler and they inhale a, a medication that causes their airway to open, the action of that drug is acting right on the airway essentially, and so that could be loosely considered a local action. But most of the time we think about a local action is this drug is acting at the site at which it is placed. Systemic action then is probably the most common and that's where the drug is administered but it acts someplace else. And that would be again referred to as systemic action. So the action can be on the whole body or it can be on a target tissue but it's not right where you put the drug. Um, going back to a local effects for a minute, sometimes um, like an example of this would be like if somebody had, had a rash, an eczema or something, right, which is sort of an allergic condition affecting the skin in which it can cause the skin to be kind of abraded. Um, they tend to itch a lot. And if there's any sort of open wound and you put a drug locally to that location, um, like on the skin, for example, some of that drug could be systemically absorbed and they may develop side effects, systemic side effects. So even a drug that's administered locally can still produce systemic effects, but the action would still be local. So I think for the most part, this is pretty straightforward. Um, occasionally this can get confusing, like uh, where people tend to go sort of astray with this is when we start to look at like the skin patches. So we have like uh, pain meds that sometimes can be administered via a patch or oral contraceptives that are administered via a patch, like an estrogen patch, for example. Um, and in those cases, when you put the drug, or, pardon me, you place the patch on the skin, it's not acting at the skin. So even though it's a, it's a, a skin contact, right, it's being applied to the skin, it's still being absorbed via the skin, moving into the blood, and then affecting the target elsewhere. So if the, if the, I guess the easiest way to think about this is to think about where's the target, where's the action. If it's anywhere other than where you've put the drug, then that means it would be systemic. And those are by far and away the most common types of applications. So I wanna run you through the routes of administration. So we've gone over the difference between systemic and local, and now we're gonna look at the different routes of administra administration and for focus on the advantages or disadvantages of each of these routes, some of the cautions for some of these individual routes, and then again, if it's local, systemic, action, or both. All right, so we're gonna kinda of go through some of the places where we might put medications. First is the skin and the mucous membranes. These are usually considered topical and oftentimes are considered local, but not always. I gave you some examples of other options for systemic. But again, local is usually the intended action. So this would be like any antiseptic agent, any cleanser, any emollient or moisturizer, that would be a local action. Um, if the skin is broken, then we may see some, t some systemic absorption. Um, again, the systemic examples of applied to the skin, the best example I can think of are those skin patches, right? Um, the patches, that, that would be a good example. You know, um, sometimes they put heart meds, nitroglycerin in a patch, pain, medica pa pain medication in a patch, um, uh, agents to, st to help to s s facilitate the cessation of smoking in a patch. Those would be all, local, all applied to the skin, pardon me, but with a systemic um, action. 
Um, mucous membranes are another route, potential topical route of administration. So we've got nose drop sprays, decongestants, hemostatic agents. Those are things that stop bleeding. Um, with any case, we can get some systemic absorption. It's mucous membrane. It's pretty vascular. So we have to kind of consider that. Um, and as we get into some of our different conditions um, in our individual units, we'll talk some about some of those pot potential contraindications. So on the slide there, it talks about glaucoma. Um, agents that are sometimes used for glaucoma, can, and they're, they're used topically, they're drops. Um, but they can have some systemic side effects. And so if somebody has a condition like high blood pressure, which could com com potentially be compounded by the application of these topical eye drops, then you wouldn't want to use those for those patients. Um, okay, these are some systemic uh, op options for the application of the nasal mucosa, vasopressin, um, which is also antidiuretic hormone, cocaine, heroin, right? Those are outside of therapeutic uses, so we don't really need to think about those in terms of clinical pharmacology, but that comes up for other conditions and other circumstances, pardon me. Um, so inhalation uh, routes of administration, we can do uh, antibiotics this way. There are um, things that can help to break up secretions that can be inhaled. Um, those would be considered local administration. There's gases that are inhaled, <clears throat> anesthetics, gaseous anesthetics, um, carbon dioxide, oxygen, nitrous oxide, those kinds of things. Um, in, in terms of mucous membranes and the genitourinary tract, most of the time its local action is intended when you are applying something to the mucosa of the genitourinary tract. But again, anytime you have traumatized tissue, the option for systemic absorption is always there. All right, so we're gonna focus on, we're gonna, we're gonna really focus on the enteric routes or enteral routes and the parenteral routes. So the term enteral or an enteral route refers to any interfacing with the GI tract. So anything you swallow into the stomach down the hatch through into the esophagus and into the stomach and then ultimately into the intestines, that would be an enteric route. Sublingual and buccal administration. Sublingual is um, under the tongue. And that's, you know, so this is a little bit confusing because uh, under the tongue, you've got a pretty elaborate vascular bed. And so some medications, like one I'm thinking of off the top of my head is nitroglycerin, which is a medication used for angina or chest pain. And sometimes they'll uh, it will administer nitroglycerin under the tongue. And the reason for that is because if we swallow it, it's not as bioavailable. But if it's under the tongue, it gets absorbed into the bloodstream and it's sort of a, a portion of it bypasses the uh, GI tract. So um, in that case, you know, considering it purely enteric would be probably not totally correct. Buccal is between the cheek and the gum. That's uh, common in dentistry. Rectal administration. You are going to get, if you, you utilize this route of administration, you're going to bypass the liver to some degree, but you are going to still get some GI uh, interfacing. We'll talk more about that. So the, the um, intestinal tract is kind of an interesting area. It's a big long tube, as we know, um, and the majority of medications are administered this way because it's easy and it's cheap, and as long as they can swallow, it's you know probably the most available route of administration. But then we've got to think about absorption, and remember that's that whole pharmacokinetic stuff. So. Um, absorption can be an issue with gastrointestinal pathology. So absorbing things across the gut is a major limitation to this particular tract. Another thing, or this particular route of administration, another thing to think about is anything that, let's see if I have a picture here. Oh, it's coming up later. Anything that gets absorbed via the gut, um, the uh, stomach, but more appropriately, the small intestine, there's very few drugs that get absorbed in the stomach. Um, with the small intestine, whatever gets absorbed goes into the vascula 
vascular bed that's wrapping around the small wrapping the intestine which is pretty elaborate and then goes directly to the liver and as we know the liver is our main site of bi of met metabolism and biotransformation so if a drug is going to get knocked out in the liver to the point where it's not going to then be able to continue on in general circulation at a high enough concentration to actually be effective. Remember that dose response curve that we we saw, the free drug has to, the amount of free drug has to be above in the blood has to be above that minimum effective concentration in order for the drug to actually produce an effect. So if the gut if pardon me if the liver knocks it out and it's not able to produce an effect, then this wouldn't be a good route. And so many times drugs that we can't give orally, the reason for that is because of this limitation. But short of that, it's convenient, it's easy, you know, as long as everything's okay in the GI tract and it's, it's the, the drug is formulated in such a way to survive that sort of inhospitable stomach, you know, with a pH of about two, um, then we can use this route. So here's another one of my favorite, um, cartoons. Uh, so we always have to sort of think about when we're using oral medication, we have to kind of know, have an, a little bit of an idea of what's going on with the GI tract, you know, and, and, you know, most of this is taken into consideration when they're studying drugs. They're not going to, you know, approve a drug for use orally if it's not going to be bioavailable that way. So lots of times this is already done. Um, so, but I, I will say that there can be pathology in the, and in test GI pathology is really common that can get in the way of this really working as effectively as it should. So not every drug is going to be able to be given it orally and those that aren't are usually not able to be given orally because of the fact that they're metabolized too quickly in the liver. And so then we'd have to maybe go sublingual, maybe rectal or do parenteral, which was what we'll talk about next. Um, there's some redundancy here, but Generally, when we're giving something, well, always when we're giving, well, like with the exception of maybe an antacid, which I have listed there, um, we're thinking of a systemic effect here. We're swallowing this pill. It's going to get absorbed across the wall of the small intestine, and it's going to move into the blood supply, and then it's ultimately going to go into general circulation and ho hopefully find the target while the concentration of the drug is still high enough to be effective. So this is easy. It's really pretty safe. You have a while before you start to see the effect, so it's slower to take effect, but that's helpful if you mess up or if you need to do something in that respect. And again, it's gonna be less expensive. It doesn't require somebody injecting, it can do it at home, all that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes we have to consider what's happening with food and how that interacts with the oral medications. So a couple rules of thumb. <clears throat> if you want a drug to be administered, or pardon me, absorbed more quickly, you'd want to give it before they eat, right? The stomach is empty, so the transit's going to be faster. You give the medication, it's going to get absorbed more quickly, but then we have to also consider that it's going to be destroyed more quickly as well. Um, if the drug is irritating to the GI tract, you're going to want to probably give it with food. And if you want to slow the absorption, then you'd want to give it after they've eaten. So before for quicker absorption, but keep in mind that it's going to get broken down more quickly. If it's irritating, we do with food. If you want to slow the absorption, you'll do it after food. And again, that just slows transit. Um, so what you kind of want to think about in terms of the contraindications, why you would not want to use this oral route would be pretty obvious. If the patient is vomiting, giving them an oral drug, not such a great idea. Uh, if they're unconscious, of course, they've got to be conscious to swallow. This is a voluntary action, so that won't work either. So in that case, you'd have to do something different. If the drug is way too irritating, then we're going to have to give it a different way. Or again, if it's going to get broken down in the liver too quickly so that it's not bioavailable, then we'd have to give it another way. Um, what we refer to when we're talking about the fact that the drug gets broken down too fast in the liver, they refer to that as first pass metabolism, which means it gets metabolized extensively in the first trip to the liver. And therefore, it's not a viable route of administration. So we know the stomach's kind of a weird place. It's got a really acidic Gastric emptying is oftentimes unpredictable. Sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's fast. There's a lot of variation from patient to patient. Um, 
most of the time we this is this is taken into consideration if a drug is going to be deemed oral an oral administration then we know that the stomach is acidic this is not a big surprise and so the oftentimes the drugs are coated or they're protected in such a way that they'll survive the uh, that in potentially inhospitable environment of the stomach um, sometimes we want this drug to be broken down in the stomach, in which case uh, we, we'll talk a little bit more about that in our third video, our third unit, excuse me. Um, all right, so I've talked to you about this quite a bit already, but so it, again, if we're thinking about why an oral drug might not be able to reach blood concentration, if it get to the blood in a high enough concentration, pardon me, one would be it's not absorbed through the GI tract at all, can't get absorbed. Um, another is it's going to get destroyed by digestive enzymes or it gets get destroyed by the liver because it's going to move into the portal circulatory system right from the intestine and then go right to the liver. So those are all reasons. Oh, there's a picture I was looking for. So I'm sure you guys remember this, but this is, of course, the GI tract. Lots of every the bulk of it's missing, but you can see the portal circulatory system. So whatever gets transported across the wall, the small intestine isn't here, but this is where it would be, moves into this vascular bed and then goes straight to the liver. And then from the liver goes into general, or ultimately goes to the right side of the heart and it gets pumped into general circulation. So those are all of our barriers right not it doesn't get absorbed or the other thing to think about which we're not really talking about pathology here but i think it's a good place to, to include this if someone's got like an inflamed gi a gastrointestinal tract if their small intestine is inflamed if they've got crohn's disease or if they've got um you know small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and they've got a lot of inflammation or if they've got celiac disease which causes blunting blunting and flattening of the mucosa of the small intestine right they're not going to get to absorb much of anything either so that's some pathology to think about right there's 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 the issues that are that are inherent in the drug and then there's the issues that are potentially um existing in the patient all of which can complicate this so in the case of this digestive enzymes destroying the drug or the drug being destroyed by the liver, we can bypass portal circulation to some degree if we use the sublingual route or the buccal route or the rectal routes of administration. I'll get more into that in a minute. Here's just another visual of looking at the barriers. So if a drug's administered, um, it's, these are the barriers that it has to get across, right? The stomach, most most drugs are going to move into the small intestine and then they're going to have to leave the small intestine and they're going to get into the, ultimately into the um, portal circulatory system, get into the portal vein, go through the liver, go into cir general circulation, then get to the target tissue, then have to get moving and, you know, affect the cell. So there's a lot of barriers and a big part of our unit three will be to kind of go through all of these variables as we think about how drugs are moving through the body and ultimately what the body's doing to the drugs. All right, so here's a little bit more on the sublingual and buccal. Remember, again, these are this is a good option for drugs that are destroyed by the liver and or by digestive enzymes. If we're utili utilizing this route of administration, we don't want them to chew it and swallow it because if they do that, then it's now it's oral, right? So these are drugs that you don't want to chew and swallow. You want to let them to be absorbed, or you inject them right into that um, those that mucus mucosa there. All right, um, we do do some local, those are systemic, but there are some local uh, actions as well. And of course, those are mostly going to be um, dental. The, the dentists are going to use these routes for pain and or antiseptic. All right, so locally, erectal administration, um, probably the most well-known local effect would be to stimulate the defecation reflex. So if somebody is constipated, um, just sometimes inserting a drug into the rectum will facilitate that response and will trigger a bowel movement, get some peristalsis going. Um, but more frequently, we're going to be thinking of systemic use here. And so again, these are some of the options, retention enemas or suppositories. And why we would use this route would it get be, again, it's going to bypass the liver and the digestive systems. Not too much. If I remember correctly, it's like 25% of the drug bypasses. It's probably in your book. It's not, some of it will still get into the digestive tract, but um, I think, I think 
seven, I think maybe it's 75% bypasses and 25% goes into the GI tract via portal, circulator, portal circulation. And if a drug's too irritating to the stomach, we could give it rectally. If they're vomiting, we could give some of our anti-emetic, those are drugs that stop vomiting. Um, if the patient is unconscious, this would be an option, or uncooperative. Generally, this changes somebody's tune. If they're uncooperative, they tend to start cooperating when you decide to give them their medications rectally. Um, so that's a strategy. Uh, but unconscious, vomiting, those kinds of things, we would consider this particular route of administration. All right, so the term parenteral refers specifically to anything other than the GI tract. Most of the time when we use the term parenteral, we're thinking of injections, but this can also be those skin patches we talked about earlier. So when we bypass the GI tract, we are delivering the drug directly to the bloodstream. And the benefit of that is there's not as many barriers to absorption. We don't have to pass across, pass so many membranes. So if you need to get a drug in rapidly, giving it parenterally is going to probably be the option, um, but keep in mind that you're directing, going directly into the bloodstream, so the absorption is gonna be very fast and the blood levels can get high pretty quickly. And so um, it's really hard to prevent total absorption via this route or adverse effects via this route. Um, Sometimes the medications that we inject are caustic and, and or irritating to the tissues, so that's something to kind of be aware of. And also this particular route has the ability to introduce some microorganisms, and that's something we need to be sort of cautious with. And of course there's, you know, technique involved with this and, you know, s sterile technique and all of that, which you'll learn at some point. So traditionally the um, parenteral route is dependent on the, where the needle is placed. So there's a lot of options. I'll show you some pictures here. Whoa. Um, so here would be subcutaneous administration. Uh, the benefit of this, or, or pardon me, this is really only going to be useful for um, a very small volume. You can't put a lot of fluid in subcutaneous tissue, obviously. Um, so that's sub-Q. Then we have intradermal, more shallow yet, not used that often, except for like in the case of like the TB skin testing, they do that intradermal. Um, when they do allergy testing and they inject antigen, uh, this is an intradermal injection. Uh, intramuscular, this is used a lot. Um, intramuscular goes down into the muscular layer, of course, you can see the needle there. Um, the benefit here is this can spread the medicine out over a pretty large surface area. Um, depending on what you're injecting, if it's a suspension, it tends to be absorbed more slowly, or if it's something that's, that's more watery, it's going to be absorbed more rapidly. The benefit of the IM administration is you don't really have a lot of sensory nerve endings down there, so this doesn't really hurt. You know, they might feel a little bit when the needle is inserted, but once you get down in there, it doesn't, they don't really feel much. Um, and also because there's not as much, um, there, there's not as, as much vasculature down there, you're mo most not likely to get as much irritation. Uh, you do have to be a little cautious because you can nick a blood vessel and or a nerve in that area. And so generally what they'll do is they'll sort of like put the needle in and pull back a little bit and just pull the plunger out a little bit, make sure you don't get any blood. And then you'll know that you're in an okay area. If it's an, if someone, if you hit a nerve, they're gonna, your patient's gonna tell you, so you'll know right away. But a blood vessel is a little bit different. And then we have intravenous and we have intraarterial. Uh, intraarterial is a very specialized uh, injection, which we're not gonna talk about, but intravenous injections are done commonly. So, um, IV are going to be the most rapid and potentially the, well, intraarterial would be more dangerous, but uh, we're not going to talk about that. So of the more commonly done uh, parenteral administrations, intravenous is the potentially the most dangerous, and that's because of the fact that we're getting right into the vasculature. Um, we got to think about irritation of the veins. Um, 
So generally, if you need to get something in immediately, you need to get the blood levels up quickly, this would be the way to go. Sometimes you can infuse uh, IV fluid over a long time, and this is what we do to replace fluids, electrolytes, those kinds of things. Um, when you're learning how to fill a, an IV bag, there's a lot of technique around this as well, mostly around making sure that you use sterile technique and you don't use the same needle to pull up a bunch of, pardon me, different medications because sometimes there can be some incompatibility there and that can cause some like little crystals to form and you don't want to in inject that into somebody. All right. Couple other ones here, intraspinal, right? You're gonna insert the needle somewhere in the spinal uh, column there, and there's different options. Oh, I had another picture, but it disappeared. Epidural, subdural, and, and subarachnoid space just sort of depends on, you know, where you're getting the needle in here. Into the joint cavity would be referred to as intraarticular. Here's sort of a summary of our different routes of administration, you know, and where they go. I like this picture because of this. So we've got the oral routes. They're gonna go into the gut and then to the liver and then ultimately into general circulation and then eliminated via the feces or um, the urine. Once they get into the general circulation into the blood, we've got intravenous directly into the blood. We have our injections, sub Q. Um, intradermal is not, oh, there it is, uh, intramuscular, we've got our patches right into the blood, we've got our inhalers right into the respiratory tract. So you can kind of see, and then from the blood, we're going to excrete things from the blood either into the gut and the feet out via the feces, out via the kidneys and the urine, we can sweat some of it out, and also we can expire some of it as well. So that's kind of our summary of this unit and the routes of administration. Again, if you have any questions, I think for the most part, that's pretty straightforward. Just kind of walk yourself through what the difference between local and systemic. Again, where people kind of get confused with that is like the examples of the skin patches. And just remember the way to make that determination is, is where are you putting the drug and where is the action? Where's the target? If they're not at the same place, they are not, it's not a local administration. Um, you can have both, you can, you can utilize the skin and or the mucous membranes for both local and systemic. So just kind of make sure you know that. And then the rest of it, I think, is fairly straightforward. Um, in the next unit, unit number three, we're going to talk a lot more about actions of drugs. So I will see you then.